This week on the Green Left News podcast, refugees protest for permanent visas and Latin American solidarity with Palestine. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis and I'm speaking to you on stolen Gadigal land in Sydney. Uh, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, it was uh, stolen by force and sovereignty has never been ceded. And Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in campaigns for justice uh, and land rights and all the other important campaigns. Um, we've got a good... Uh, topics this week on the podcast. We're going to have two great interviews. So uh, we're going to be talking to Ben Radford um, later in the sh- podcast about uh, Latin American countries and solidarity with Palestine. So what's been done so far, what's kind of the history of, of Latin America, uh, of Palestine solidarity in countries in Latin America. And he's actually going to be speaking to us from uh, Peru. So that's going to be exciting. Um, but first up, we're going to be talking to uh, Chloe, about um, the, what's been popping up recently is these refugee encampments. So there's the two primary ones. Is the, it started in um, Nam or Melbourne with uh, an encampment outside Claire O'Neill's office on July 15, and that then was moved to the Department of Home Affairs when kind of cabinet was reshuffled and Claire O'Neill was no longer the immigration minister and Tony Burke took over instead. And then the other, uh, the other one is outside Tony Burke's office in Punchbowl in uh, Sydney, um, which started up a few uh, about t- two weeks ago. Um, so, yeah, so Chloe's going to be talking to us about what these encampments have been set up for and, uh, and like what uh, refugees are fighting for. So welcome to the podcast, Chloe. Thanks for having me, Isaac. So... Yeah, there's, there's roughly about 10,000 people who have been stuck on these, kind of stuck in limbo uh, on temporary visas and, and other things for, for just over a decade. And I guess when Labor was elected, they said they were going to put an end to this. Um, but there's, there's still, yeah, about 10,000 people who have, have missed out. Um, so just obviously in, in that context, Chloe, because you've been involved in campaigning for refugee rights for years in, in, in various groups. But what kind of led to these encampments being set up as kind of the next stage of, of the refugee rights movement? Yeah, um, well, yeah, you said it. It's because over 10,000 refugees have been stuck on temporary visas and Labor is not doing anything to fix the issue. Um, and these 10,000 refugees have been waiting over 12 years. I mean, 12 years is a long time to wait. Um, And, well, there are some reports now that there are less than 10,000 just because apparently some people have been deported in that time and or have been forced to return because they couldn't cope with the ongoing barriers of of living here on a temporary visa. Um, But what led to this encampment, I mean, it's not the first time refugees have, you know, set up kind of protests like this. Um, uh, And... Yeah, there was, if you remember last year, 22 refugee women walked all the way from Melbourne to Canberra in their quest for a home um, and belonging for all refugees in Australia. They walked over 100 kilometres um, to draw attention to their situation. I think this encampment might have drew inspiration from some of the student-led encampments for Gaza on the university campuses. Um but it's it is pretty heartbreaking that these refugees really they they feel like they have no choice but to have set up this indefinite encampment protest and we do need to do everything we can to support them um and it is just really horrific that the federal government has created a situation like this um that you know has left th- these refugees feeling so desperate that they feel forced to set up an encampment outside on the streets um, to get the permanent visas and protection that they absolutely deserve. Yeah, and, and I, I like how you said how they were inspired by, potentially inspired by the Gaza Solidarity encampments um, at universities across the country and around the world as, as well, particularly in the US. Um, and those encampments did have quite 
success in you know a few months of camping um, or however long it, it's different at each campus basically but uh, majority of campuses have, have won disclosure as a first step um, in their campaign for a complete divestment from Israeli uh, institutions and weapons companies um, so it's proven to be a kind of a, a, a strategy that can have um, can be quite successful um, but I guess yeah, as I was saying kind of at the start, um, when Labour was elected, they kind of had a promise that they were going to end this limbo and, and you know, give permanent protection to refugees. But what, have, what have they actually done since being elected and, and why have, you know, this roughly 10,000 or so missed out? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, since the Albanese Labour government came to power, they have not done much. I mean, they've done some things. Uh, they've said that 19,000 refugees can now apply for permanency. I mean, that's not that's not because Labor wants to be nice to refugees. That is because they were pressured by the movement, by the refugees themselves and other activists. Uh, but Labor has, they are still putting those 19,000 people through another application process. So some of them are having to wait even longer. Um, and why have more than 10,000 people missed out on permanent protection? I mean, there's there's a, a variety of reasons that we can go into. I mean, it's the classic, you know, dividing, dividing people. Um, but they did this deliberately because they want to punish the people who came here by boat and, you know, to show how, how tough labor is on borders. Um, so the, the 10,000 refugees who are stuck on bridging visas, they have suffered more than a decade of discrimination. Uh, they were subjected to Scott Morrison's fast track process. Um, so yeah, it is it is actually an attack on people who came here by boat. That, and those are, those are people who um, are among the most desperate people seeking safety. And that stop the boats slogan, I mean, that really became deeply ingrained in Australia and is an expression of the white Australia policy. Um, we need to get rid of this uh, um, boat turnbacks policy. It's against the UN Refugee Convention and an act of piracy for a maritime country uh, like Australia to turn back boats on the high seas. I mean, it's our version of a Donald, a Donald Trump's wall. So, um, yeah, I mean, with these 10,000 people, there are also asylum seekers um, that have are still waiting for their uh, claims to be processed. So the Australian government is just denying its responsibility, but they have they have been facing some pressure, but it's not sufficient. Um, and I think that before the Labor government got elected, people did believe that they were going to see massive changes. I mean, the, there are some people who got their hopes raised, including refugees. Uh, they thought Labor would really change things, but, you know, Albanese promised to he promised to leave no one behind but that and that was like one of his slogans he promised to take refugees off temporary visas but you know they they still haven't resolved these horrific issues i mean many people feel very let down by um uh labor's lack of attention uh ne neglecting refugees but also uh labor support of israel's genocidal campaign against uh palestinians so yeah, the, the Federal Labor Party have basically refused to do anything about expediting this group of, um, uh, ten, well, it's, it's, it's the, the, the number varies, but around ten to 12,000 people. Um, and they actually just, the government could just fix this overnight by simply changing the regulations and granting protection to all of these refugees who have really gone through the long process of, um, trying to get permanent protection um and yeah just you know i guess like another thing we need to remember that there is a, an economic basis for the government's racist refugee policies the ruling class really does have a they have a, a motive a, a stake in the borders being real, militarized so um this just helps legitimize its control of you know, who is allowed to come into the country and under what circumstances they come. So it's it's really an attack on the refugees that came here by boat. Uh, 
Yeah, we've seen this kind of um, racist border policies uh, in the news recently with Peter Dutton saying no no one should be allowed to come here from Gaza, basically, um, though there's no issue with Israelis coming. Um, and, I mean, I think at the stats of saying it's like uh, a few, th- uh, just over a thousand or so uh, refugees have been settled from Gaza since October, whereas more than 8,000 from Israel. So there's, there's those numbers as well. But and I also guess previously, Australia granted 11,000 Ukrainians temporary visas, which um, it's a good thing. Um, and they offered 6,000 additional places over three years for Afghan refugees, which, you know, wasn't enough under the humanitarian program, but it's way more than Palestinians. Yeah. Yeah, so that it's worth pointing out that kind of hypocrisy. I guess I just wanted to ask um, if if you had heard like some of the stories that you've heard about how difficult it is to live uh, on a temporary visa or with this kind of insecurity about your future, because um, obviously there's there's a few different elements like you can't access um, kind of uh, Medicare and uh, Centrelink payments and things like that. So, uh, what are the other kind of challenges that um, these people are facing well i think one of the yeah it's they have they, their situations vary so um in terms of medicare some some refugees are do have access to medicare um some don't um and if you do have access to it you have to reapply every six, six months as, a, as i as i understand it, it's a very arduous and stressful process um particularly for people whose first language maybe isn't english um, they're denied access to study rights, to, to proper work rights. Um, they have to rely on the, the generosity of the community and charities to get by. Uh, they can't get home loans to buy houses. Um, they, uh, there's also, I think one of the cruelest aspects of being on a temporary visa, not having um, equal rights in this country, is actually the lack of family reunions. So a lot of refugees haven't seen their families in over 12 years and some have lost, um, you know, they've lost out on those fundamental years of their children's lives. Um, Some have lost their parents in that time. Um, Yeah, I just can't imagine what it would be like to to not be able to reunite with with your family um, just because you're you're a refugee. Um, Yeah, so those are some of the things, I guess, the healthcare one is is quite a, a big deal because um, if you think about it, they have limited work rights, or you know, um, they're they're very exploited as well on temporary visas. Um, the fact that they're tied to their bosses, a lot of them have to take um, cash in hand jobs where they have you know a pretty bad working work conditions, and they're afraid to do things like you know maybe some of them are afraid to do things like join unions. Even you know we. We don't know um, all their situations, but um, I, you know, I have heard stories of not being able to access proper health care. So, you know, for example, a, a woman who's a refugee who might need to access abortion, um, it's it can cost up to seven thousand dollars to access abortion uh, abortion services. Um, that that's a lot of money for someone who has precarious work conditions or restricted. Um, working uh work rights yeah 100 percent. and there's i'm sure there's you know countless like little small things as well as these obviously major barriers that make life hard like a lot harder um when you don't have this kind of permanent visa and you know where your security is going to be in in the future um so back, I guess back to the kind of encampments that the one in Melbourne in particular has been going for over a month now um, and, you know, started up in the middle of winter, it's freezing cold weather and rain. But the other thing that they've encountered is kind of this kind of harassment um, and, you know, attacks from far right groups and various kind of, um, you know, yeah, thugs and things like this. So uh, what? What kind of things are these have these far right people been doing, and and how have the refugees and the supporters who are at the encampments been uh, resisting? Yeah, so the Nazis, or they're from uh, I think the socialist um, network or 
something like that. I can't remember what they call themselves. It's like the National Socialist Network. That's the one. Yeah. So they they rocked up uh, last week. We had a 400 strong protest, um, and then they they came. There was about 20 of them that that came uh, with a banner that said "Fuck off, we're full." Um, and they were only there for a short time. I mean, they, they were, um, you know, we, we drowned them out with our chants. Our, our rally was very disciplined. Um, we drowned them out with our, our chants that said, welcome, shouting, well, um, refugees are welcome, Nazis are not. Um, and, you know, after about 15 minutes, they, they went away, away uh, escorted by police. So that was a a victory, but you know, you know, it, it was frightening for some for some of the refugees, um, and for for us as well to see that kind of presence um, at a refugee rights rally. Um, and but it was interesting to see the even the mainstream media linking it to to some of Dutton's comments, uh, his racist comments recently about banning all Palestinians from entering Australia, and um, you know, basically calling innocent um, civilians from Palestine, just basically saying that they're all terrorists in the making. So they're, they're sort of trying to, they were li- trying to link those racist comments to the emboldening of of these people. Sorry, that's the dog. He's, <laughs> she's mad about the um, Nazi presence as well. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think neo-Nazis are sort of encircling, um, being emboldened by some of the... Um, racism from the government, particularly the, the coalition, but also um, Albanese as well. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it was quite inspiring, inspiring that, um, you know, the refugees' spirits are not dampened um, by, by their presence. Um, and also I should point out that it's not just far-right groups that are intimidating refugees. They have also been harassed by council officers that have uh, try to deny their right to amplify their voices with megaphones. They have denied them rights to um, allow them to set up tents and tables so they can actually, you know, they've actually been sleeping on the ground in the open, cold winter air here in Melbourne. Um, so they're actually made to feel even more vulnerable and uncomfortable and unsafe um, with, with neo-Nazis and uh, racists running around uh, while they protest. Um, and, and and it just it also shows the attack on the ability to protest for anything, including better, better living conditions and the right to remain in the country. Um, but they they you know refugees and and support, uh, supporters are continuing to resist, um, and um, yeah they're continuing to organize. We're continuing to organize protests. I mean they are they're led by the refugees, which is very empowering. Um, they're continuing to raise their voices. We had a union contingent um, at, the, at the last rally, which was um, which was really great to see some of the um, United Workers Union uh, come through. And this Friday, we're going to have an even bigger refugee rights rally at the encampment um, outside Home Affairs, outside the Home Affairs uh, Minister's office. Um, and also, you you, you see um, the refugees sort of. I think uh, at the last Sunday Palestine rally, uh, the one, the big mass rally we have in the city, um, we saw uh, well the refugees actually led that rally with their um, their contingent led it, and that that was really good to see. Um, and you can also see refugees from different communities uniting, like between you could see the solidarity between Tamil and, and Iranian uh, communities, um, and also refugees who have uh, maybe gotten, um, you know, some some have actually got um, come off those CHEV visas, which were five-year protection visas. Um, they haven't forgotten about the refugees who have been left behind. So, you know, they're, they're continuing to show their support and solidarity. Um, so th- these are the ways that we're continuing uh, to resist. Yeah, awesome. So if people want to get down and you know spend some time at the uh, encampments so it's a massive help um, I believe the address for the Department of Home Affairs in now Melbourne is 800 uh, Burke Street in Docklands um, correct me if I'm wrong um, and then in Sydney it's outside Tony Burke's office in Punchbowl and it's uh, at 29 slash 1 Broadway um, in Punchbowl so 
you know, even if you can only spend a few hours down there, um, it's great to head down to the encampments, have a chat. You can learn probably even more, like you learn a lot more about it than just from listening to this. But um, uh, it's always, always more people welcome. So get down and get involved. And I believe, I don't know the details, but I believe there's talk of encampments being setting up, being set up in other cities. Um, so keep your eye out for that if you're, if you're not in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, and, you know, there's, there's always refugee, um, you know, action kind of groups uh, across the country. So get involved if, if, if you're able. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us, Chloe. Uh, it's great to have you on, as always. Thanks for having me, Isaac. So Israel's genocide in Gaza is approaching 11 months with the official death toll passing 40,000, although the real death toll is likely much higher. Um, and in Australia, we've had months of campaigning leading to some small wins, but the movement hasn't yet achieved its primary goal of forcing Labor government to stop supporting apartheid Israel, cut ties and put real pressure to end the genocide. So today on the podcast, we're going to be looking at some examples from Latin America to get an idea of the impact of the Palestine solidarity movement there. Um, so to kind of explain all this for us, we're lucky to be joined by Green Left journalist and one of the original hosts of this podcast, Ben Radford. And Ben's been traveling around Latin America for the past year or so and has been researching Palestine solidarity movement over there. So welcome to the podcast, Ben. Thanks, Isaac. Thanks for having me. So I guess uh, you've recently prepared, uh, written an article about the kind of links between Latin American governments and Palestine solidarity and also the links with Israel. Um, so I guess to kick us off, what kind of ties has Israel had with Latin American governments and uh, historically? Yeah, so Israel's involvement in Latin America is is mostly to do with supplying weapons, uh, surveillance technology, and military training. So historically, Israel's had ties with basically all of the most brutal Latin American dictatorships, um, like the Dominican Republic in the 50s, El Salvador in the 70s, Costa Rica, Honduras, Ecuador, you name it. Um, basically, any, any violent military regime in in the last century in Latin America, Israel has more than likely supplied weapons and helped train the army, the police, or the right-wing death squads um, that have together been responsible for millions of deaths. Um, just to give some examples, Israel helped arm the Somoza regime in Nicaragua, which ruled from the 30s until the late 70s and killed tens of thousands of people in this time. And at the peak of the violence um, in the 1970s, um, Israel actually accounted for 98% of their arms imports. And then after the, the Sandinistas, the revolutionary Sandinistas, toppled the Samosa regime in the late 70s, then Israel switched to supplying weapons to the Contras, who were a, a counter-revolutionary force who, were helped, um, who Israel helped train um, with their retired army officers and commandos um, to to wage this war against the, the Sandinistas. And in Guatemala, Israel supplied, again, weapons, training, surveillance technology to various military regimes um, between the 60s and 90s, where about 200,000 people were killed or disappeared in, in this genocide of mostly indigenous Maya people. And some of this technology, for example, was, was actually really was extremely sophisticated for the time. Um, for example, in the 70s, an Israeli company called Dadiran, who actually later merged to become what's now Elbit Systems, they built this huge computer listening center to essentially spy on the population. And so this center had the names of 80% of the population, and it could do things like detect changes in water or electricity use in a, in a private home, which could indicate to the government if for example, that house was running a printing press, which would then obviously be classified as like a, an anti-government activity. Um, but beyond the, the direct military support, um, there also was this really strong ideological influence from Israel. And uh, this was the most evident in, in Guatemala, where uh, 
we also saw this, this export of Israel's settler colonial model to the country. So the elites in Guatemala would often directly refer to, to Israel's methods of, of seizing land by violence and then settling them. They would refer to that as a, as a model that they could then implement in, in Guatemala's rural areas. Um, there's even a quote from a, a government official um, in the 80s at the time called Eduardo Waller, who was quoted publicly on the record talking about uh, how his technicians have been trained by Israelis and how they draw inspiration from the model of the kibbutz and the moshav, which are, are types of Jewish settlements. And that that's, that's the model that they're looking to, to impose on the, the highlands in Guatemala. And obviously throughout this whole time, there was a, a constant presence of, of Israeli advisors to, to help them do this. Um, in Chile, during the, the dictatorship of Pinochet in the 70s and 80s, um, Israel again helped train their armed forces, their police, their intelligence services, supplied tanks, missiles, aircraft. And while the, the, the full extent of, of their involvement isn't, isn't known because of their efforts to cover things up and their refusal to release any records relating to it, uh, enough is, is known to paint this picture of their, their support for these brutal regimes. And even now, uh, Israel is still a huge supplier of weapons, um, of surveillance technology, of training to Latin American governments. Uh, they provide the, the phone hacking Pegasus spying software to, to El Salvador, Brazil, Mexico, Ecuador, Peru. Um, and that, that doesn't look to be stopping anytime soon. Yeah, it kind of sounds like Israel's been playing this role of like a leading kind of uh, global far right kind of uh, figure for all these other uh, you know dictatorships and far right governments to kind of follow by example and work closely with as they're you know still kind of doing to this day. Um, interesting as well. Obviously, a lot of these uh, dictatorships in Latin America over the years have been backed by the U.S. So there's that tie as well, where U.S. backs Israel and a lot of these um, far-right kind of fascist governments as well. So there are all these links going back decades. Um, yeah. I guess on the other side of this, is there been any history of solidarity with Palestine from uh, Latin American governments? So I guess because of, of Israel's role as, a, as this military supplier, as I just talked about, um, so this had, had the intention of, of one, obviously profiting, but two, and importantly, it was, it was to win, try and win the support of these Latin American governments um, on the international stage for their ongoing settler colonial project in Palestine, or at the very least to stifle criticism or, or condemnation of it. And I, you could say that it was pretty successful on the whole with, with most of these governments, you know, more than happy to, to keep receiving Israeli weapons and training and as you mentioned, this is especially in the case of, in the case with regimes that had close ties to the US. They would generally also have really strong relations with Israel. But that's not to say that there haven't been governments who have, have gone against this uh, US, I guess, dominated approach of, of unconditional support for Israel. For example, Cuba hasn't had diplomatic relations with Israel since the 70s. Um, neither has Venezuela since uh, Chavez in the 2000s and uh, in, well in solidarity with with Palestinians and then with the second Intifada in in 2000 there was this I guess renewed surge of, of Palis Palestinian solidarity movements sorry solidarity movements with Palestine coming out of the region um, this is particularly the case in in Chile where the political convergence between indigenous movements and the Palestinian diaspora is is quite strong um, so it wasn't uncommon to see Palestine solidarity protests called by both groups um, in Bolivia under the the presidency of Evo Morales um, they broke off diplomatic relations with Israel in 2009 and then in 2010 they recognized the state of Palestine with its uh, 1967 borders but then after Morales was ousted in a coup in, in 2019, then the, the incoming far-right regime uh, re-established relations. 
But then when Morales' party, the, the MAS, the Movement for Socialism, got voted back in in 2020, uh, we've now seen uh, another change. So, yeah, I guess as, as that example highlights, it's often dependent on the government at the time with generally left-leaning governments uh, more inclined to stand with Palestine, whereas right-wing governments, you know, usually pretty closely tied to the US and their interests uh, will support, will tend to support Israel. Uh, but obviously what what's a constant in in this is that there's the, all the grassroots organizations that have uh, never stopped standing in, in solidarity with Palestine. Yeah, so that kind of, kind of brings us to the next question. And you mentioned that like uh, indigenous people in Latin America have had a close ties with um, Palestine solidarity. And you write in your article that they are most impacted by the violence and dispossession that Israel has enabled through all this supplying weapons and, and military technology. Um, but what are the kind of ties between uh, the various kind of grassroots movements in Latin America and Palestine solidarity, particularly since, you know, since October, the international movement uh, really exploded and there's been these huge rallies all around the world and millions of people being drawn into action. Has there, what's the connection like uh, with the different movements in Latin America? So I think at, at a basic level, I think the, the, interconnectedness of social media which now allows people from from all over the world to see the the first-hand destruction and as well as hear from palestinian voices um not to say that social media doesn't also have huge problems with censoring palestinians and and pushing often right-wing agendas but i think people still have a lot more access than what they would seeing the news that passes through you know the filters of corporate owned media so having this access to these images and stories of, of the atrocities that, that Israel is committing, it's, it's undeniable to so many people that Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians. And so they're mobilizing in, in huge numbers against it, um, which we're seeing all over the world. But I think more specifically, when, when looking at Israel's role in Latin America, I think it helps contextualize why there's been so much grassroots mobilization in solidarity with Palestine, where you've got people that are uh, aware of this huge responsibility, like I was talking about before, that the state of Israel has played in helping aid repression and violence in their own territories. And so the big connection there is that many of the groups mobilizing are, are aware of, of how the same weapons and the same tools of oppression used on Palestinians every day have been exported to Latin America and, and used on them. And then another thing that's key to this is the level of solidarity that's that's coming from First Nations peoples in Latin America, who, as you said, are the, the most impacted, have historically been and still are the most impacted by the violence and oppression which Israel has played this, this huge role in enabling. And so they're coming forward articulating this link between their struggle and resistance as First Nations peoples fighting against colonial oppression and fighting for self-determination. Uh, they're linking that with the Palestinian struggle. Um, so, for example, in, in, in Chile, while the, the government of, of Bodish has overall been pretty weak on Palestine, there's been significant grassroots support throughout the country. Um, and uh, one reason for this is that Chile is actually home to the biggest Palestinian diaspora outside of the Middle East, um, which explains some of the big mobilizations in solidarity. There's been some big fundraising events to uh, raise money to send to Palestine. But... Uh, indigenous Mapuche people have also played this leading role in the demos um, to these communities who are fighting to reclaim their territories from colonization, particularly against mining uh, and extractivist interests. And the Mapuche have, have historically uh, faced terrible violence, some of the worst violence in Latin America at the hands of the state and paramilitaries. And they also have to deal with uh, heavy police and military presences in their, in their territories and also, you know, the, the daily violence and harassment that, that comes along with that. And the police and soldiers are uh, walking around carrying Israeli-made machine guns and assault rifles. And then when the Mapuche resist, they're persecuted by the state under so-called anti-terrorism laws that essentially allow arbitrary detention and harsh sentences, um, so essentially criminalizing the defense of their own land. And, you know, we can see those that's such a close similarity to the to the detentions without charge or trial that that uh, occur in occupied Palestine. And then 
that same Israeli surveillance technology that's used to spy on Palestinians is also being used to spy on the Mapuche. And so, you know, it's no surprise that, that the Mapuche leaders and as well as indigenous groups across the whole region are drawing these parallels between their own struggles and their fight against colonialism uh, in their own territories with that uh, in Palestine. And in other countries, there's there, there's been quite a lot of significant street mobilizations, like in Colombia, um, in solidarity with Palestine, particularly since the the October um, attacks by Israel. So even at, at the big May Day rallies and Pride events, um, you see lots of banners, uh, lots of Palestinian flags. Um, in Brazil, there's been again a lot of a lot of big demos with thousands of people showing their solidarity with Palestine, but also coming with clear demands on the Brazilian government to take action against Israel, like suspending their military contracts and cutting off trade. Um, because while uh, the president Lula has, has had some strong public rhetoric condemning Israel's destruction of Gaza, um, people are highlighting that it's super hypocritical when Brazil has also supplied 10% of Israel's crude oil in the last nine months. Right. Yeah. So yeah, there's like those two sides of these huge rallies and grassroots mobilizations. And in some countries, the governments respond, whereas in others, they don't, don't take as much notice. But um, just while we're on this topic of, I guess, the kind of more grassroots mobilizations and different campaigns that are going on, you recently did an interview with a campaigner with the Get Out Mekorot or Fuera Mekorot uh, campaign which is against kind of a Israeli uh, water apartheid, which is impacting people in uh, Latin America. So I just wanted to ask uh, for a quick summary of, of what that campaign is all about. Yeah, sure. So uh, Fuera Mecorot was a campaign that yeah, started in Argentina um, against Mecorot, which is the national Israeli state-owned water company. Um, so Mecorot essentially owns and, and manages all of the water resources in Israel and occupied Palestine. So they have essentially implemented this system of, of water apartheid where uh, Israeli settlements and Israeli like Jewish populated areas are supplied with, uh, in some places, nearly unlimited water to, for, for pools, for, for everything, for the houses, where in Gaza and and the West Bank, like occupied occupied territories, uh, they restrict the flow of water, and so we've got this we've got this case now where Israelis have access to, by world standards, so much water, and whereas Palestinians are below the the World Health Organization's recommended uh, daily water consumption, and so what Mekorot has now done is is I guess exported this system of water management all around the world and they signed contracts with with governments in latin america to uh manage water resources but what it means is it essentially uh represents the 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 imposition or the, and the privatization of of water so in argentina um various provincial governments had signed contracts with mecorot and so the the fuera mecorot campaign sort of arose to to oppose that to to make public as well a lot of the, because a lot of it were really backroom deals where they signed contracts with, with Mecorot. They're quite a secretive company. Um, and so this camp campaign came about to, to raise awareness um, to, and to stop the entrance of, of Mecorot into Argentina because it represents a, a privatization of water. But then also it's, a, it's part of the, the BDS campaign to isolate Israel and isolate Israeli companies and, and councils and governments that have ties to to these israeli companies yeah awesome and if, if people want to find out a bit more about that you can read ben's interview with uh, gisela cardozo who is uh, an organizer with fuera mecorot um yeah but i guess to move on to uh my kind of next and final question um we talked a little bit about the grassroots mobilizations and how some of the governments have been res uh, responding what are some of the kind of concrete actions that have been taken? Um, so I guess from a from a broad national sense, I guess maybe these are these are more symbolic uh, than concrete, maybe. But some Latin American governments have have taken 
steps to, I guess, isolate Israel and have been vocal in their, their condemnation. So, uh, for example, Bolivia's cut diplomatic ties in October. Colombia did earlier this year. Um, Chile, Brazil, Honduras and Nicaragua have, have withdrawn their ambassadors from Israel. Um, and then Venezuela, Cuba and Nicaragua have supported South Africa's case against Israel. Uh, for genocide in the International Court of Justice. And so while this, there's another case that, that's not as widely publicized as South Africa's, but Nicaragua has actually also brought a case before the ICJ, but against Germany um, for their complicity in, in genocide by su continuing to supply weapons to Israel, because about a third of Israel's military imports um, actually come from Germany, which makes it the, the second biggest provider after the US. Um, so they're sort of symbolic, but I guess probably the most significant example is is coming out of coming out of Colombia with the president Gustavo Petro uh, being probably the, one of the most vocal government leaders against Israeli genocide and the first to take some concrete actions. Um, and it's I mean it's also significant when looking at historically Colombia has had some of the closest ties with Israel out of Latin American countries. Um, and this has been since the 1980s when Colombia first started buying arms from Israel. And the government uh, relied really heavily on right-wing paramilitary groups at the time to put down uh, guerrilla uprisings, uh, as well as inflict violence on, for example, indigenous communities defending their land. And so these paramilitary groups were supplied with weapons from Israel, and many were even sent to Israel for training. So. And these paramilitaries were responsible for 50% of, of the about half a million people killed or disappeared between 1985 and 2018. So that's just a bit of context. Um, and so what, what's happening in Colombia at the moment is, as I mentioned, recalled its ambassador, but then Petro also announced uh, in February that they would stop buying weapons from Israel and then broke and then followed with breaking diplomatic ties in May. Um, but the most significant is when Colombia announced in, in June that it would suspend coal exports to Israel. And this didn't just come out of nowhere. This was off the back of a, a sustained campaign by this alliance of indigenous groups and trade unions in Colombia who responded to a call from Palestinian trade unions for a, a global energy embargo of Israel. And so... A few weeks after Israel's attacks in October, uh, Colombia's biggest mine workers union called Sintra Carbon, they called on the government to stop coal exports to Israel in solidarity with Palestinians and then also called on trade unions globally to, to take action. And so just for a bit of context, uh, indigenous groups in, in Colombia are really impacted by mining interests. Um, they're displaced from their territories, their land's contaminated, their water is stolen, they face violence from the, the mining companies and the, the right-wing militias that they employ. And so they've, they've obviously been fighting against mining interests for a lot longer than since Israel's latest uh, attacks on Gaza. But they joined this campaign uh, articulating the, these parallels between their struggles and those facing Palestinians. So they had combined demands for mining companies to be held responsible for their human rights violations, both in Colombia and in Palestine, and with a clear demand for the government to stop coal exports. And so this joined up with a, a global day of action against the, the mining corporation, Glencore, which is actually responsible for 90% of the, the Colombian coal that gets sent to Israel. And so it was a few days after this, this global day of action that Petro then announced um, that he would be suspending coal exports to Israel. And so I think that's just one really, really powerful example of how these internationalist struggles can be, can be articulated in this effective way and then the impact that they can have in, in starting to turn the tide against the complicit and, and implicit support for, for Israel's genocide. And another thing with the, the suspension of, of the coal exports is that it's significant because Israel is, is actually quite dependent on coal from Colombia because it uh, made up 60% of their coal imports last year. And then more broadly, Israel is, is almost totally dependent on coal and oil imports, which uh, 
this I think this represents a uh, or presents a really significant opportunity to to take concrete action in the form of a, a global energy embargo. And the actions taken by Colombia also really show this difference between some of the tokenistic rhetoric from some government leaders to uh, concrete actions that are actually in line with with the global movement to isolate the apartheid state of Israel. Uh, but you know, as we've seen, this this usually only happens after a sustained uh, grassroots campaign to to pressure the governments into action. Yeah, and it's it's as you said, it's very inspiring to see you know all these struggles, you know, workers union struggles, uh, in, in indigenous justice, you know, climate campaigners, uh, international solidarity, um, obviously kind of coming together to on this one big campaign that's obviously led to, you know, one of the most significant sanctions against Israel since October and since the genocide started. Um, and yeah, it's great to, you know, see how that that's all worked. And, um, Hopefully, we'll see more uh, campaigns like this have success in various countries. Obviously, uh, the US is probably the big one. If if a, camp a successful campaign like that could happen in the US, uh, that would probably mean the end of the genocide and probably the probably even bigger impacts than that as well. Um, and I guess it also shows the advantage of having a uh, not just those strong grassroots campaigns, but combined with a progressive kind of left leaning government who's actually willing to enact the demands as, uh, and follow through with what the campaign's demanding is, is really important. Um, well, that's all the questions I had uh, for you today, Ben. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Was there anything else you wanted to, to add? Um, I think I'd just encourage listeners to, to keep reading Green Left. I think there's, there's lots of good coverage of the, the Palest Palestine Solidarity Movement in Australia and all around the world. Um, there's interviews there with with students in the US who were a huge part of the encampments there, the university, university encampments. Um, there's reporting on yeah on the Palestinian uh, solidarity with Palestine from all over the world. So I would encourage people to to, to keep reading that, to stay on top of it. But thanks. Yeah, for definitely having me. check out uh, all of Ben's uh, articles and and stuff he's written while he's been over in Latin America. And we'll definitely want to uh, chat to you again about um, some of the developments. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have you back. And thanks for joining us. <laughs> Cheers. See ya. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. If you want to help us out, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support for only $5 a month. It also makes a big difference if you share this podcast with your friends or leave a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're using. A uh, massive thanks to Sean Valenzuela at Little Archer Beats for the music that you heard on this podcast. And as always, make sure to check out the Green Left calendar, greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find the nearest rallies and protests that are happening near you. Uh, and particularly join any uh, Palestine actions that are happening in your area. Uh, thanks for listening.